Hey everybody, I know it is Tuesday, but we're going to do our Ask Mike because our senior analyst is back from vacation. It was hopefully a good one. Yes, it was good. I'm all refreshed. I'm ready good. to do Ask Mike. Ready to go. These are going to be the best answers yet then. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right, let's jump right into it. Of course, we're going to start as Lanny wants to know a coronavirus update with college football. Yeah, we said from now on until this gets resolved, we'll start off with coronavirus update. And it's been two weeks since we did one. Uh, there's some good news out there. If you remember back when the teams first came back together, the athletes came back together for strength and conditioning workouts. Right off the bat, there were a bunch of cases. LSU had 30 guys in quarantine. That doesn't mean 30 positive cases. But they had a bunch of guys that went down to bars and Baton Rouge and apparently got there were some infections. And so that was real terrible. Everybody said, oh, this is not going to work. And then uh, I think Iowa State maybe sent everybody home. Houston sent everybody home because they had so many cases. Well, now here we are a month later, five weeks later, and it looks like that situation's kind of reversed itself. Over the weekend, Oklahoma reported testing all of their people. It was over 100 people tested, and they had one positive test. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Notre Dame reported testing 150 people. That would be staffers, athletes, you know, coaches, everybody. And they had, didn't have a single positive test, so that was good. And the last time Hunter Juracek gave an update, which was several days ago, he said there is one active case out there right now. And so I think that's pretty much what we're seeing. It shows that these athletes are getting smarter. They're being more careful. But once again, I will repeat this. It's not an issue for athletes to test positive because they're not getting sick. The issue is that's apparently what seems to be driving whether or not we're going to be playing college football, which I think is all whacked out, but that's the way it is because Hunter Juracek, or not Hunter Juracek, Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, said in his latest statement about all of this that we got to get the caseloads down, and that would be across the SEC area. We can't have these high number of daily positives. And he seemed to suggest that unless it goes down, it would be bad for playing college football. Again, let me explain why that one doesn't have anything to do with the other. Athletes test positive. They don't get sick. They get quarantined. They're back in a week to 10 days. Now, people have said this to me, but Mike, if you play football, these athletes, they may not be getting sick, but they'll go out and make other people sick. I don't understand that logic. So if they don't play college football, what will these athletes press a button and cease to exist? They can't go out and get, make anybody sick. They are more likely, if they're not playing football, to go out into the general public and like anybody else that's out there, they could possibly, if somebody had it, they could pass it along. But athletes as a group are safer because they're tested more and because they're educated. They, they go through classes all the time about how to avoid issues. And so they're just much less likely to cause an infection out there in the general public. And if they're playing, they're going to be around their team more. They're, they're not going to be out among the general public. So I don't understand that logic. But still, it is what it is. Apparently, whether or not we play ultimately is going to de depend on what the ca daily caseload is across the country, or at least in the SEC areas. And that's got to go down. Now, the latest thought, I mean, you have two conferences, the Pac-10 and the Big 8. They've already said they're pretty much going to play an eight-game season, which means conference games only. That would allow them to start in October, so that gives you more time for these caseloads to drop. It looks like the SEC is aiming for maybe 10 games, maybe a couple of non-conference games. There are a bunch of these SEC schools, like Arkansas, which has Notre Dame on its schedule, that wants to play these high, these big games. And there's a lot of pressure from ESPN well, and CBS to do this. And, and to break off on that, he specifically said, Hunter Juracek, look, the SEC and the ACC play a lot of rivalry games like Florida State, Florida, South Carolina, Clemson, uh, Louisville, and Kentucky. And they're better because they're in the same state and they're closer. It makes no sense to eliminate those games just because they play in another conference. Exactly. And, and again... ESPN, CBS, they want to make money right now. Yeah. They, they're going to have problems too. So these big name games like an, an Arkansas Notre Dame game would be bigger than an Arkansas Nevada game. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that the SEC is trying to figure out a way to play at least two non-conference games. That would probably be a mid-September start. But again, 
by then, I think these daily caseloads have to be down, so we'll see what happens. We will. All right, Delta Boy wants to know, how will small colleges survive this big five conference game only plan? It would be bad for them mm -hmm. uh, because they get most of their revenue from playing these games where they get a big guarantee to go in and play somebody. Nevada's going to get a lot of money for coming here and playing Arkansas. If you take that money away, they don't generally, these teams don't tend to generate enough money from their own crowds and they don't, they're not always on TV, so it takes a big chunk out of their overall athletic budget, which, you know, football is, is still the prime driver everywhere. So what happens? What are they going to do? Yeah. Well, they're going to have to reduce salaries and that would start with the athletic director, the coaches, pass on down to uh, assistant coaches, and really anybody that works for the athletic department, they might eliminate some jobs. Mm -hmm. Then what else would they do? Well, they got to reduce travel costs. That would mean riding a bus instead of flying. Now, we're talking about these smaller schools, these mid majors. Yeah. But you might also see them look at their schedule and go, wait a minute, we got this game where we're going halfway across the country. We're going to eliminate that game, have an open date, and we're going to play these teams that are closer, and we're going to go there, play, and come back in the same day so we don't have hotel bills. You can get creative and mm -hmm. cut these costs down, but yeah. here's the real issue, Alyssa. Yeah. These things will be temporary if this thing is not an issue next year and we're playing games as normal. Sure. But a lot of people believe that out of all of this, those Power Five conferences may decide, wait a minute, this is the way we need to go anyway. We need to be playing each other. So you might see them try to form their own division within the NCAA, which doesn't include mid-majors, or maybe break off and start your own version of the NCAA where you only play each other. If that happens, what you will see is across the country, mid-majors would become like high schools in terms of mm -hmm. playing football or other sports. Sure. You just do it for fun. You, you don't have a scholarship. You know, it's easy to do that in football. How do you last, even as a Power 5 school like Arkansas in basketball season and baseball season where you play so many games and there are only so many Power 5 schools to play? I'm it's, not it's sure. Tricky. I'm not sure. Right. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. Sure, but, it, it, but it's hard. Th that is a thought that yeah. it could happen as a result mm -hmm. of all this. And people right? have been talking about that before COVID ever exactly. happened. And obviously you've seen a lot of smaller schools like Furman, for example, cut their baseball program. Mm -hmm. So programs are being cut and that's the biggest thing that's hurting some of these smaller schools. Absolutely. All right, Cy, uh, Sid Rock wants to know, is our athletic department in trouble if football season gets canceled? I don't know that it's in trouble. If you're an SEC school, you've probably got a pretty good situation. Hunter Yurichek said a long time ago that he sat down and came up with every scenario. We'd, here's how I would do it if we play some games. Here's how I'll do it if we play no games. Uh, if they don't play, salaries are going to be reduced. Positions are going to be eliminated. It's a lot like what I talked about with the smaller schools. Now, I don't know that they would eliminate flying to mm -hmm. games, but I'm not sure exactly how that would work out. But it would filter down to the to the so-called non-revenue sports. You may see some of those non-revenue sports taking long bus rides. Mm -hmm. Now here's a step that would be interesting. If you eliminate a sport, even for a little while, let's say mm -hmm. for two years you're going to eliminate this sport. If you do it on the men's side, that's fine. You can't do it on the women's side unless you eliminate an equal number of scholarships on the men's side because it's protected by Title IX. So I don't know if they get into that I don't think sure. the big schools would. Yeah, I don't think they're touching scholar, especially because the SEC just said if you choose not to play as a student That's athlete right. this year, your scholarship is protected. Well, I don't know if that plays into a, unless your school decides to just cut your whole program. There's a separate issue. You Almost know? every SEC school has done these facility upgrades. Yeah, they said like $16 million in debt Arkansas is with these facilities. Yes, and, and with the, and then when you, that's the new ones, mm -hmm. and then with the, uh, north end zone facility so you're you still have to pay that mm -hmm. now let's say they they play but they don't have fans mm -hmm. okay that's still over half of your revenue from football yeah. you, you're still and, and look there may be a little bit of relief here because if you don't have fans in the stands guess what's going to happen your tv viewership is going to go up right. so you might see the conferences come back and say to espn cbs wait a minute We've Maybe looked more. at your ratings, your numbers are way up. You've got to give us more of that money. Right. Uh, but there's got to be a way to make up for some of this, and I'm not sure, sure all how it will all uh, come out. You know what I do know, Mike? 
That's way above our pay grade. It is. We, we don't have to worry about <laughs> no, it. No, we do. don't. Exactly. Peacock wants to know, if we end up with conference play only, no fans in the stands for games, do you see a possibility of SEC schools going to pay-per-view to try to offset lost ticket revenue? Now, pay-per-view is old technology. Mm -hmm. It was way before these current ESPN, CBS, uh, even NBC contracts. All schools, if you're an SEC school like Arkansas, all games are on TV one way or another. Yeah. So you're getting more money from that than you could ever get for pay-per-view. Uh, the, the, first of all, even if you tried to do it, the, the networks would say, no, you got a contract. You're going right. to play this game on our airwave. So yeah. that's not going to happen. Yeah. No. All right. KD or K Dog Stew to you. That's right. All right. It. Okay. I have been watching when they're all close together, you have to like decipher them like a license plate. Right. All right. I've been watching tape from the 2019 games. I noticed that last year's team continued to run against seven in the box, and those attempts were repeatedly stuffed by linebackers. Will the Browns offense allow the QB to change plays at the line, or is the offense going to rely on sideline coaches for audibles? Okay, I don't think Bryles has been asked that question, mm -hmm. but I've never heard of, a, of an offense or an offensive coordinator that doesn't allow his quarterback to call an audible. Mm -hmm. And believe me, Arkansas mm -hmm. was calling audibles with those seven different starting quarterbacks they yeah. had over two years. The problem wasn't not calling audibles. The problem was inability to process properly the various run pass options. And it really started with this whole idea, I'm the quarterback, I stick the ball in the mm -hmm. running back's stomach, do I leave it there or pull it out? The only two guys that ever did that, pulled it out and ran, were at the, the end of last season, John Stephen Jones and Jack Lindsey. Mm -hmm. And we saw them have good success with it. The other quarterbacks didn't do that. It made it harder on the running backs. If you're coming after Arkansas and you're in the backfield <laughs> and you see the quarterback stick the ball in the running back's stomach, you go after the running back because that's where it was going to stay. Yeah. Now, the other issue with that was this part of the RPO that involves the passing game, quarterbacks looking at the receiver, looking at how you know, various receivers, looking at how the secondary and linebackers are covering them, and then he makes a determination whether to throw the ball or yeah. run it, and they weren't processing that properly either. That led to a lot of interceptions, uh, some incompletions. So it was really a failure of the quarterback. And let me just say one more thing. Mm -hmm. Average Arkansas fan blamed all of these problems on the offensive line. I said this before, and then it was reinforced by some of the coaches later on that are still on that staff. The offensive line actually got better last year, and that's one of the reasons they're optimistic this year is because they, they're a year further down the road and a lot of mature guys. But it wasn't so much a problem with the old line. It was a problem with the quarterbacks yeah. making mistakes that got blamed on the offensive line. There's a reason why we cycled through so many QBs and not so many offensive linemen. That's right. Fans just sometimes don't like to see that. All right, here we go. One Tusk over the line asks, if multiple conferences adopt a conference-only schedule, is there still room for a playoff at the end of the season? And if so, do you have any idea what that may look like? Well, in my opinion, if they play college football, they'd be absolutely nuts mm -hmm. not to have a playoff. Because what are we talking about here? Two weeks, two yeah. weekends. You're talking about four games or two games and then an extra one. So that's three total games. Mm -hmm. You play two games on one weekend. You then end up with a national championship game. It's real easy to do, and it would be done just like they're doing sure. it now. You have a selection committee at the end of the season, pick four teams, and then over those two weeks that sure. they're supposed to play it, they play a national championship. Big money games are not going to be eliminated if we play, and, and that's the way it would be done. And people remember, an SEC school in these playoffs means money for Arkansas, whether it's Arkansas or not. That, that's so true. that's important. You're sharing There's, the revenue of exactly. the conference. There's money there, and uh, I think this is the most important reason why we have a committee you think about all the situations, a committee is going to be able to put a little asterisk and say, I get we only played 10 games, and I get that things might not be as strength of schedule might be mm -hmm. different now. A computer is not going to be able to figure that stuff right. out. All right. J.B. Carroll says A&M's AD wants to play this year. Oh, I'm excited about this. Whew. With Arkansas and College Station, Mike, what do you think is going to happen? It's unclear. I still think if you really had to press me, I still think that game is going to be played in Jerry World. However, Hunter Urejek did say, because it's A&M's AD that wants to play it mm -hmm. at, it's their year to be the home team, mm -hmm. so he wants that game at College Station. And he wants it at College Station because they don't have to pay a rental fee to Jerry World, and they've got a bigger stadium than Jerry World, which they can fill, so they're going to make more money off that game, and right now money is important. Mm -hmm. Hunter Urejek said, well, 
I might consider doing that if you agree to come back to Fayetteville the next year. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue is once they do that, home and home, what happens to Jerry World? Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, neither team wants to really continue that because, again, Arkansas can make more money at home. Now, the difference is Arkansas wants to keep a game in Jerry World, but they want it to be a non-conference game. And so if they could do something really quick, you might see the end of this contract. But I don't see that happening because you schedule yeah. those games down the road three, two, sure. three years. So if I had to guess, I would say that Arkansas wants to continue this Jerry World game with mm -hmm. A&M until the end of the contract. That gives them time to come up with a replacement team or teams yeah. to play instead of A&M. But the truth is both of them, A&M and Arkansas, want out of that arrangement. I want to ask you a question off of this because everyone's talked about, well, A&M's AD wants this. What does Arkansas want? Will this happen? Will this happen? But no one's ever said, okay, what is Jerry Jones going to do? Because at the end of the day, you have a contract yeah. with the Cowboys. And can Arkansas and A&M just say, never mind for a few years. How, at what point does Jerry step in and say, no, I don't think so, or yeah, that's okay? Yeah, he might do that. I think he would tend to go along with whatever Arkansas wanted, mm. just well, you know, because obviously. of his ties to Arkansas. <laughs> but again, if there were some sort of an arrangement to replace that game long term with, and what I've talked about on the show is a, a logical, would be the big, a logical way to change it would be Big 12 teams, TCU, Baylor or teams in that general yeah. area that would come in Texas would be mm -hmm. one of them. You might even get Oklahoma State to come down and play you there. Mm -hmm. That Those kind of games would still be a big deal and would still probably draw pretty good crowds in there, so he'd be happy. But I don't. again, I don't know if they can do that real quickly. So we may yeah. have to see the end of the contract before we see that switch over to it being a non-conference game there in, in Arlington instead of uh, A&M. Yeah, it'll be interesting. All right. Ida Meyer wants to know, Peyton Hillis apologized to fans in a new interview. He cleared the air on previous statements critical of Chad Morris and Sam Pittman. Is everything okay now? Okay, we need to give some yeah. background on this because Hillis did a radio interview, mm -hmm. I think, and he was critical of Chad Morris and uh, Sam Pittman because he said that as he watched Arkansas's program go downhill over several years, he really felt like he wanted to step in and contribute and do something to help the team. And he wanted to talk with either of those coaches. He said he approached both of them through a third party to see if there's something that I can do to come in and be a part of the staff in some way to help. And he said nobody called him back. And he was very angry about that. He said people talk, these coaches talk about, you know, bringing former players in and having them close to the program, but apparently it's all talk. Um, and, and he made a lot of people mad, not because of Morris. I think if he'd have just stopped with Chad Morris, it would have been fine. But when he included Pittman in there, I think he made some people mad, so he came back and apologized. Because well, it's like, whoa, whoa, man's only been here six Exactly. So, and no one's been around the player, so <laughs> he ain't even been around his that, players. That's true. And so, so that what? was the problem with that. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? Is it all over? Well, yeah. I think something like that kind of stick. I think if he wanted to coach at Arkansas somehow, he didn't do it the right way. If this is a thing where he wants to get into coaching, yeah. he needs to do what Ryan Mallett and Drew Morgan mm -hmm. have done recently, and they have gone down to the high school level to start. Yeah. And that would be a good way to start. It's very, I don't care how good of a player you sure. were in the past. If Ryan Mallett's not on that staff, you're, there's, there's probably no way anybody's just going to jump in there. I mean, we don't see Darren yeah. McFadden. Hey, DJ, DJ Williams has been trying to get a tight end job That's for about right. three years now. He's, he has. So <laughs> it's very difficult. It's one thing to be an ex-player and to come around and give inspirational speeches. Sure. To be on the staff that's a little more difficult. Can I ask you something about Peyton Hillis? This was something that someone brought up about him being forgotten. Of course, he was in that backfield with Darren McFadden and Felix Jones. Do you feel like Peyton Hillis is a forgotten Razorback? Well, in some respects, maybe. Uh, and he shouldn't have been because mm -hmm. he was really important. I mean, they don't win. Their biggest win, arguably, was beating LSU, which ended up winning a national championship that year, in Baton Rouge. So you beat, you're an Arkansas team. You beat a national championship LSU team in Baton Rouge. Well, if you go back and look at the highlights of that game, they don't do that without Peyton Hillis. He was yeah. huge in that game. So yeah. probably tended to get overlooked. And mm -hmm. I always had no issues with him in terms of the media. He butted heads with the coaches over stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think he ever had problems with the media. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, he's a yeah. nice guy. Yeah, he, I've, I've met him a few times nice. Um, and, you know, he made that comment about how 
his few years in Cincinnati, he gets treated better as a former Bengal than he does right. as a Razorback, which is, you know, maybe we'll look at the story of Peyton Hillis. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Question, we got two more. Razorback Redneck wants to know, what do you remember about Lindsey Howe, who passed away Saturday at the age of 53? You know, Nolan, I think, pretty much said it in this interview he did with us. He said, uh, I love that guy. Mm -hmm. And he lo Nolan loved players that worked and didn't worry about what their stats were or anything like that. Lindsey Howe played two years, the, the, the year before the 1995, the 1990 Final Four team and then the Final Four team. He was, a, he was kind of a garbage type player in that, you, you know, you had Big O underneath, but Big O couldn't do everything. And Lindsey Howe got a lot of rebounds and either scored himself or he dished it out to somebody else who then scored. So he cleaned up a lot of problems. And he could pretty, he was a good all-around player. But more than that, he was a guy that didn't worry about stats or what his, you know, what his recognition factor was or anything like that. He just went out and played. And that's why Nolan loved him so much. Now, in the four games that got Arkansas, the four NCAA tournament <coughs> games that got Arkansas, and I think it was the Midwest Regional, that got them to Denver in the Final Four. He was named the MVP of those, and that compiles all of those four games. So they don't get to the yeah. Final Four without him, so mm -hmm. he was overlooked. And here's the thing, we're losing a I lot know. of these guys, and I don't know why, way yeah. too young. This has been going on now. Hopefully it's not a trend because I don't like it. Yeah, it's not a fun one, for sure. Lanny is back to close this out here, wants to know what is up with Isaiah Joe missing the first team workout with the Razorbacks on yesterday. Cut that boy some slack. That's what <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it's going to cause people to freak out. I'm now, sure. what does it mean? I don't know what it means. You know, Kevin Maybe McPherson. Maybe had a Zoom call with an, with an NBA team. <laughs> well, Kevin McPherson, who, who covers Arkansas for us and does a great job on recruiting, he basically said, look, you know, I don't know what it means. He just wasn't there. But he pointed out that in years past, this wouldn't be an issue because mm -hmm. by the time the coaches started working out with the players, you'd already be committed one way or another. Yeah. As it is, we've still got a couple of more weeks till August sure. 3rd when he has to make this decision. Some people are speculating, well, that means that he's going. Mm -hmm. And his draft stock seems to go have gone up a little bit in the last yeah. two or three weeks. Now they're talking late first round, maybe uh, early second round or whatever. He can make some decent mm -hmm. money doing that and get a decent contract. Uh, so the issue then becomes <laughs> if he does that, what, will it hurt the team? Boy, that's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, if you listen to, if you read on a message board or on Twitter, here's what you're going to get from a lot of fans. Well, it just means that these young guys will be playing more and they'll, they won't have any problems. And maybe, but they, you know, you're starting almost mm -hmm. completely over with new guys if yeah. you're Musselman. And I still believe you need somebody like an Isaiah Joe that was big time with this team for the last two years to provide some experienced leadership. So I think it would hurt if he doesn't come back. I think what would happen is it definitely would mean more playing time for a lot of these new freshmen, and maybe by conference time they really start to click. Mm -hmm. So in the NCAA tournament it has no effect, but I do think it would affect the early part of the season. Yeah, it'll be interesting, but again, still waiting game with Isaiah Joe. Again, we have to wait till August 3rd, but you know what we don't have to wait for? Baseball. Are you Baseball, excited? Baseball, yes. Baseball, NBA, this I, week, y'all. We have a, a scrimmage right now. Our Tara Talmadge, a little Houston fan over there, got the Astros on. That's okay. I ordered my Dodgers cutout today. You know teams are doing that? You get to be a cutout, and then they put you in the stands for the whole season. Well, I want to see it, and, and it's important that they <laughs> it's continue fin, it's to play. It's my son, Finn, sitting on my, my dad's lap. So I, it's not actually me, but. Because these baseball games and then later football games, that's largely going to determine what happens to the college game. If they can oh, do this and not have problems with the players, yeah. then I think we'll, we'll definitely play. All right, good to have you back on Ask back. Mike. If you have a question for him, just head on over to hogville.net. If you don't have a uh, login, sign in, ask a question. Nothing is off limits. For Mike Irwin, I'm Melissa Orange. That's going to do it for us. We'll see you next week.